All right. So um, I think this week is actually not Raymond because you were last week. I think it's, is it Josh? It says Josh L on there. I believe it's Mr. Josh. Thank you, brother. So as we continue worship, uh, this is just a time where you can give your gifts and ties. Um, you can go ahead and pass the box around. Um, again, uh, you know, this is not something that we do out of merit or for righteousness, but out of the righteousness that has been given unto us freely. Uh, we also freely give of our ties, time, talents. So let me pray for the offering. Um, Heavenly Father, we just pray that these gifts, whether they are gifts of monetary value or of uh, spiritual investment, um, would be used, Lord, to continue to propagate the gospel, to propel the mission of the church into uh, ears, into minds, into hearts and souls that have not known you, that have yet to receive you, that think that they do know you, but have yet to love you. And so we pray, would you receive these, um, these gifts and offerings, Lord, uh, to the glory of your name as we continue now in worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How great the chasm, how great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation.
Thank you so much, God. You truly stripped yourself of all uh, glory of perfection just to die on the cross for us, Father. Thank you for saving us from our sins, that we have a, a living hope that is in you. God, so I pray that as we go on, we, we have the assurance and the confidence of who we are, um, that we have so much value as your child uh, because it is given from you. In Jesus' name we pray. All right. Can we actually keep standing for the reading of God's word? Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, <laughs> extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, Rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. You may be seated. All right. Welcome, everybody. Good seeing you guys. We're continuing our series. Oh, dear goodness. They are breakdancing up there or just breaking <laughs> up there. Um, we're continuing our series in Luke. And um, yeah, here's one thing about me, man. I love, and maybe you do too, I absolutely love zombie movies. All right. Who, who feels me? How many of you love zombie movies? Yeah. All right. All right. All right. All right. I love, uh, man, any, any kind of, you put zombies into it, man. I love it. I, I think I particularly love how like survivalistic people become and it, it's like creates opportunity to be creative. And like, uh, you know, we always ask that question, you know, as many of us do, if there was a zombie apocalypse today, where would you go? You know, obviously Home Depot, <laughs> Costco, God, Costco is a good one. Maybe Walmart, Super Walmart, they got guns there, right? So, but you don't want to use a gun because it makes too much noise. You got to go get the bow and arrow or the crossbow. So I love zombie movies. You know what I mean? There's one zombie movie, though, that is, uh, I think, particularly interesting and I think unique because of its premise. And that's I Am Legend. How many of you have seen this zombie movie before? If you haven't, I'm so sorry. I'm about to spoil it for you. Um, but it's like a super old movie, mind you. It's like a, this movie is also a recreation of an, like its original iteration, which was like made in the seventies or something. So you've had plenty of time to watch it. All that to say, this particular zombie movie is unique because in this world infected with all these zombies, there's like a, a unique spin in that this character, the main character played by Will Smith, he is immune. He is immune from the infection that causes zombification right <laughs> okay yes and so even here in this screenshot 
you, like most of the movies, you know, centralizes around uh, Will Smith in the middle of New York City. And it's like all empty. And he alone is traveling with his dog because he alone is immune from the virus. Right. And so he is also a scientist by happenstance. And so uh, in the evenings, he tries to like use his blood to figure out a cure for this zombie apocalypse. Right. I think that's particularly interesting, uh, not just as a movie premise, but I think it's interesting also because it kind of is reflective of how many of us, and certainly the character in our, in our passage today, kind of view ourselves, whether we know it or not, because there is a certain uh, cultural immunity that I think we project on ourselves, right? I think a lot of people, when they come into the church or when they read the Bible, when they think about spiritual things, there's this assertion or assumption that they are immune, automatically immune to some of the truths of the gospel or some of the truths that God testifies to. So I often hear, you know, and we'll talk about this in a second. I often hear phrases like, I like to believe that God is, and then you fill in the blank. Even though what they fill in the blank with might not be in the Bible and might not be true, there's still this perception of like, well, because I believe it, it suddenly becomes true. There's almost this immunity to the objective truth of the Bible. Or, you know, man, just think about this. If we did what we're doing now, but we did it in that building with your parents, and I was preaching the same sermon, do you know what the automatic assumption is? Oh, Pastor Phillip's not talking to us adults. He's talking to these kids. There's an automatic immunity, even though I could be preaching from the Bible, right? And, and so uh, what's interesting about I Am Legend is that it, I, I almost think, and I almost wonder if there's a similar phenomenon happening in many of our souls and many of our hearts. But the danger of it is that, man, the cost of self-immunity is eternal. Here in this, uh, in the beginning of our passage, Jesus addresses in verse 9, people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated, treated others with contempt. In other words, he's talking to a group of people in a time and a period, not unlike ours, where they felt and they thought and assumed that they were immune from the teachings of Jesus. And we see that particularly through this word contempt. This is a crazy word because this word in the Greek, it comes from this giant Greek word, exutheneo, I believe is what it is. And it literally means to make no account. It means to treat someone as if they were nothing. When I was uh, in high school, my dad asked me a very poignant question. He said, Philip, what do you think is the opposite of love? And so I naturally said, hey, and my dad was like, good answer. Ultimately wrong, but good answer. And he tried to break down for me that hate and love actually come from a similar place. If you really love somebody and you really hate somebody, you're actually kind of doing the same things. You're constantly thinking about them. All your decisions and actions revolve around them, right? You will save money for whatever reason for them or to be against them. Love and hate come from the same sort of place, that, that sense of devotion, that sense of constancy and commitment. And so he said, the opposite of love is actually contempt. The worst possible thing you can do to someone is to treat them as if they don't even exist. For instance, if you had a crush and you really love that person, it's almost better that they hate you versus don't even acknowledge that you exist. The opposite of love isn't necessarily hate, it's contempt. And therefore, that makes contempt one of the most worst things you can do to somebody, one of the worst things you can have for someone. Some years ago, there was this book written by a guy named Malcolm Gladwell called Blink. And it is a phenomenon, it's a fascinating book, rather, I should say. I recommend you guys all read it at some point in your life. It's a book that really focuses on how quickly we make assumptions. And so there's a story in the book where there was a, a study done where they showed five seconds of a professor's lecture and had like thousands of students rate that professor literally based on five seconds of watching that professor. And within that, those five seconds, all these students made these crazy radical conclusions about how good of a professor that was. 
And what's fascinating is that if you continue to watch that lecture, it actually would become like an awesome, and that professor is rated as like an awesome guy, but those five seconds kind of twisted our perception. And um, later on in this book, he talks about how quickly we make assumptions when it comes to like relationships too. And so he talks about this study done by this guy named Dr. Grotteman, I believe. And Dr. Grotteman has sat with and counseled thousands of couples. Um, and he has concluded that there are four key ways to destroy a marriage. One is, uh, what is it, defensiveness. Another is stonewalling. The third is criticism. And the fourth, I believe, is contempt. And he says this in the book. Even within the four horsemen, in fact, there is one emotion that Grotteman considers the most important of all, contempt. If Grotteman observes one or both partners in a marriage showing contempt toward the other, he considers it the single most important sign that the marriage is in trouble. And he goes on to talk about how in couples therapy, when Grotteman finds contempt in one of those two partners, it's something like a 90% likelihood that that couple ends up either divorced or they end up cheating on each other or something like that. In other words, contempt, as it relates to self-immunity, is some of the most is perhaps the most devastating thing that you could practice and hold to in a relationship, including your relationship with God. And that's why at the end of this parable, Jesus says, Man, we're not, it doesn't, he doesn't say one of these people went home sad, one of these people went went home happier than the other. He says, one of these people is saved and going to heaven, and one of them is not. And so what we're going to do today, we're just going to look at these two characters as we consider how can we overcome contempt, knowing the dangers of it, knowing the devastation of contempt, that contempt, even in a human relationship, will destroy it. How can we avoid contempt in our relationship with God? And what is the role that immunity plays when it comes to contempt, all right? So first, we're going to talk about the Pharisee, then we'll talk about the tax collector, and then we'll talk about you. So going back to our text in verse 11, the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, and he goes on to this very interesting prayer. I love that phrase right there, the Pharisee standing by himself. I love how Jesus, he's, he, has, he has these quips that totally illustrate something, but also diagnose something. What does it mean for him to be standing by himself? It means that he's not leaning on anybody. It means that he doesn't need anybody. It means that he is self-sufficient. And in fact, it, it, as we look at his prayer, he prays thanks to God for his self-sufficiency. Isn't that interesting? I think it's interesting, particularly because we live in a culture that absolutely loves self-sufficiency, don't we? Don't we love it? We actually celebrate it when people stand by themselves. We love when people do what this Pharisee has done. All these self-made women and men are people that we cherish and praise in culture. And in fact, the mantras that these folks say and suggest, they're all over our media. You watch Disney Channel? What's like the number one moral of every single TV show? Be yourself. You can do it. You don't need anyone but yourself. Believe in yourself. You, you, you. And that's what this Pharisee is doing. He's believing in you, me, himself. And that is where contempt begins. Contempt, this notion of treating someone as nothing. And let me just say this as a parenthetical point. In the Old Testament, when God says things like, I will bring judgment on Israel for these things. You have kindled my anger for these things. He's saying those things, mind you, not to non-covenant people. When, he, when God expresses anger, he always expresses it to the Israelites, not to the non-Israelites. Do you know what he does to the non-Israelites in the Old Testament? Sodom and Gomorrah is a great example. There's a very specific phrase that recurs. God, quote, gives them over to their sin. Or in other words, he has contempt for them. He just, he ignores them. He lets them destroy themselves. But it's only to those whom he loves, the Israelites, that he has 
both love and hate. That's why on the cross, when Jesus cries out to God, he says, why have you forsaken? He says, why have you had contempt for me? Not why have you had wrath on me? Because what is worse than even God's hate is his contempt. What is worse than hate in a relationship is contempt. And contempt is birthed when you stand alone. When you believe you're the subject matter expert. When you believe I know better than everyone else. Or I, I know me better than anyone else. And therefore, I don't need anyone else. And Jesus goes on and says, this contempt-filled, autonomous individual prays, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. What is he saying? He's saying, thank you, God, that I am, I am an individual. I am autonomous. I am unique from other people. I know better than these other people. I've done better than these other people. And then he goes on to verse 12 and says, look, here are evidences of what I do to make myself a better person. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. This is an individual who doesn't see the need for other people. He's completely autonomous. And therefore, out of his autonomy, he has complete contempt for even God himself. Or to illustrate another way is like this. The way this person sees God is not as God sees himself. This person sees God through him, himself. You see that? In many ways, in that prayer, what's fascinating is that commentators will, will notice that he's not really praying to God. He's actually kind of praying to himself the way he talks about himself. Here's some connection points. Friends, this image right here captures, I, I kind of want to say like at least 90% of the relationships I've and friendships I've built here in the Pacific Northwest. People, particularly here for some reason, and maybe it's a West Coast thing where people are just really concerned with like chill vibes. There's this complete obsession with filtering who God is or filtering the world through oneself. And so we get these phrases about God, particularly here, that say things like exactly like I said earlier, the way that I like to think of God, or the God that I believe, or these assumptions like, well, God wouldn't do that. And it goes both ways. People believe in this self-filtered God, or they disbelieve in who God is because of their self-filtered reasons. I don't believe in God of the Bible because God wouldn't blank. If God was truly God, he would not. That's a perception of God through the self or the world through the self. And that's what the Pharisee is doing, isn't he? He's filtering who he sees, how he sees himself and God through himself. Even though God is this cosmic creator who's eternal, authoritative, alone knows truth and authors truth, this Pharisee, possibly a citizen of Seattle, sees God through himself instead. But here's the danger. of Here's the cost of doing that. When it comes to, therefore, the conclusions, the biggest conclusions you make for yourself, if you view God and the world, or even yourself, through yourself. The best conclusions you can come up, come up with about yourself are limited to yourself. Okay, I know this is getting kind of deep, kind of philosophical here, okay? In other words, if you struggle with guilt and shame, for instance, if you feel guilty for doing something bad, if you perceive God only through yourself, then you will never believe that you're forgiven because your perception of God is limited to your own self. And so even though God of the God of the universe says, you're forgiven, you're righteous, you won't believe it because you filtered God through yourself and you come up with conclusions like, well, 
that may be true for them or him or her, but it's not true for me. Or when God says, you, you must honor your parents. You must honor the Sabbath. There's this temptation of like, well, that applies to them, but not to me. You see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? The Pharisee is a man riddled with contempt because he stands alone. And in standing alone, in seeing himself only through himself and seeing God only through himself, he comes, he comes up with all these crazy self-conclusions. Maybe much like some of us. In contrast, we have a tax collector who's quite different. The tax collector in the parable stands far off. He doesn't even come near where the Pharisee is. He would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast, right? A sign of great agony saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Where does this tax collector, what, why does he do that? Why does he see it fit to stand far off? Where did he even get the language of calling himself a sinner? Where are all these presuppositions and conclusions coming from? They're coming from God. Because he sees himself through God, he better sees himself and he better sees God. And so he responds in that manner. One historic writer, one of the authors of the Reformation, John Calvin says it like this. Nearly all wisdom we possess, that is to say, true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts. The knowledge of God and of ourselves. He's saying, if you really want to know yourself, if you really want to do what Disney Channel says, be your best self, you can do it all on your own. You have to know God <laughs> because you can't know yourself just on your own. Listen, I, I'm, so I'm in my 30s. When, when I hear the phrase, just be yourself, which is a typical thing we throw, I still don't know what that means. What does... What does that mean I should be? When you say be yourself, who, what self am I supposed to be? How many of you felt like that? And I'm telling you, you will continue to feel like that if you don't see yourself outside of yourself. If I have mustard on my face, outside of looking into a mirror, do you know what I need? I need someone outside of myself to tell me you have mustard on your face. And that's what Jesus is saying. The tax collector sees himself, not through himself, but outside of himself. He doesn't stand alone. He doesn't think that he's a self-made person. He doesn't see himself in a position to make conclusions about God outside of what God concludes about himself. And therefore, he has a sober understanding of himself and of God. My friends, At the end of this story, this parable, Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. That word justified means made right, made good, proclaimed like in a court of law, not just innocent, but made good. How good can you declare yourself? How good can you see yourself? right? Man, aren't, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, aren't the voices in our head more often saying you're not good than that you are good? And some of the most encouraging, most inspiring moments in our lives are when someone we respect tells us that we're good, more good than we thought. Some of you performed, you, you played a sport, played a game, did a concert, had a recital. And it, isn't it so good when you hear someone say, hey, you did well. It's far better when you, it's way better than when you say to yourself, you did well, isn't it? Justification, in other words, true justification can't come from yourself. It comes from outside of yourself. And therefore, the last character in this story that we need to talk about is you. <laughs> what, what, who are you more like, the Pharisee 
for the tax collector. How do you see yourself? How do you see God? Is it mostly through yourself and your assertions, conclusions that you've made about yourself? And if so, let me just ask you a couple of questions. If you perceive the world only through yourself, and let's say you struggle with guilt, will you ever feel forgiven? If you see yourself and God included through the lens of yourself, what does it mean to be good? What does it mean to be just? What does it mean to be right in a situation? Is it only when you feel like you're right, feel when you're good? You guys picking up what I'm trying to say here, right? Some of you, you know what this feels like. You, you, you commit a sin, and then afterwards, you feel really guilty, right? And in that moment, you feel worthless. But what if the God of the universe looked at you in that moment and said, no, you're still good. Not because of what you've done, but because of what I have done for you. You're still loved. If you in that moment don't believe that, that's because you see God through yourself. And you will always decapitate God's power so long as you do that, so long as you see him and yourself through yourself. And maybe I should use more specific terms now that's coming to me. Maybe I should say, as so long as you see yourself through how you feel, you will always limit God's authoritative cosmic truth. Yes, God, but I don't feel good. Yes, God, but I don't feel like doing it. Yes, God, but I don't. You see what I'm saying? That's what it means to look at God and yourself through yourself. And that's, no one can be justified that way. You can't, you will never experience goodness that way. You will only experience you and more of you. And if there's one thing that I know about you, according to the Bible, is that you and I suck. And we're quite sinful. But then... What, what, what would it look like to look at yourself and look at God through the lens of God? It means you see yourself justified and not just justified, one day exalted, exalted. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is from Ephesians 2. And Paul says, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ, excuse me, and seated us with him. He exalted us. He seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. My friends, Imagine Jesus right now. Glorify Jesus in heaven on the throne of heaven itself. Holy, majestic angels praising and worshiping him, proclaiming his holiness perpetually. And imagine you sitting next to him. That's the truth of the Bible. That's what it looks like when you see yourself through God, not yourself. When you look at God the, through yourself, you know what happens? You know Jacob's ladder? Remember that story, Jacob's ladder? He's, in, he's running away from Esau. He sleeps on a stone, and he sees a ladder. When you look at God and yourself through yourself, that ladder becomes something you climb. But when you look at God and yourself through, how, through God, that ladder becomes a stairway down, a means of Jesus coming down a means of God coming into the ordinary from the extraordinary, not the other way around. That's the promise of the gospel, my friends. And so application is pretty simple. How do you see yourself? Are you, are you the soul, soul immune individual? When you come into spaces where the word is being preached, do you sit there and kind of filter and say, well, let's see if this applies to me today. Let's see. I'm going to determine, based on how I feel, whether the truths of the gospel apply to me today. Or instead, do you see yourself the way God, the God of the universe, sees you? Do you see yourself 
through the lens of the God who knew that you would be born on the exact date that you were born, who wanted you to be born exactly when you were, who carefully and continues to give you moment after moment of life specifically intended to do something that he, he sees as good for you. Do you see yourself through the lens of God? What I also love about this movie is this. It's a great illustration of the gospel because there, there is somebody who's immune. There is somebody who is completely, perfectly immune from all disease, from all sin. Jesus. And it's through his blood that there is a cure. There is a cure and there is a freedom from even me seeing myself through the lens of me. Me seeing God through the lens of me. So the application today is that's it. Will you pivot the way you think and the way you see yourself? Will you stop? Will you put an end to seeing yourself through a filter of lies, through the limitations of our frail humanity. And instead, would you see yourself and God the way God sees you and himself? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in a culture and a world that is so concerned with autonomy, with standing on our own, like the Pharisee, in a cultural moment where we celebrate the notion of knowing ourselves better than ourselves. Humble us, Lord. Get us out of this contempt, this notion of um, seeing ourselves as the ultimate subject matter experts and seeing others as, or and particularly seeing you as less than that. And instead, Father, would you break into the callousness of some of our souls? And show us and teach us, encourage us and inspire us with the truth, the truth of your word. Lord, I don't know how many of us in this room struggle with some shame, but Lord, show us now that's a lie. That's a lie from the pit of hell. When we hear those voices, when we look in the mirror and hate what we see, break, Lord, break through those lies and teach us and tell us the truth. For some of us, whether we know it or not, we have, we have, we're riddled with pride. We think we're more than we're not, more than we are. And I pray, Jesus, would you break through that pride? Show us and teach us the joy of humility, of, of seeing ourselves the way you see us, not the way we see us. And Father, I pray, as we do so, would you continue to expand the vision of what it means to be justified and exalted by the work of Christ on that cross? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we hit the lights back there, Joan?
All right. So one of the practical kind of uh, tools, I guess, that I want to present to you today is uh, this organization called Veritas Forum. Um, in the 1970s, the president of Harvard University sat down with a very famous evangelist named Billy Graham. I don't know if you guys have heard of him. And he asked him, and Billy Graham asked him, what is the number one issue all young people are facing today? And in the 70s, <laughs> it's crazy how human beings don't change. The president of Harvard said, emptiness. And I, I, I don't know about you, but I feel like that has not changed at all. And, and part of the reason we fall into filtering ourselves through ourselves, I think, is because of a search for fulfillment, right? Self-fulfillment. Well, that's when Veritas Forum was created. It's a place, it's an organization that exists on campuses all across the nation, even at UW Seattle, it's there, um, where they invite Christian scholars, like people who have devoted their lives to, you know, the intersection of X and God, faith and X issue, technology, uh, astrophysics, you name it, biology, right? And these experts sort of come in and they, they talk about how their faith and what uh, Christianity sort of looks like in that space. When I was in college, I had all these questions. I had all these, I had this yearning and longing to see the world as God sees it. And this is a great place, particularly now that you're on summer break, to start investigating and to start thinking critically about some of these things. So uh, I encourage you all, would you at least once this week, whether you're young or old, go to veritas.org, click on a couple of lectures, click on a couple of debates and, and talks. And, uh, and have your mind blown a little bit, okay? Cool, any questions? Thoughts? All right. <laughs> All right, we're just gonna fellowship, hang out. So, and then we have some folks signed up to serve. Will you, would you serve uh, after we're done eating and snacks and stuff? Thanks y'all.